education is limited to Morehouse, Crozier, the University of Pennsylvania, Boston University, and Harvard. But his most advanced education on the Gandhian philosophy of nonviolence was taught him by Charles Radford Lawrence II, Morehouse class of 1936. Google him, get to know him, because he is the one who sent Bayard Rustin to Alabama to tutor Dr. King on the practice of nonviolence. For three days, Dr. King carried a gun in Montgomery. Baird Rustin was probably the greatest strategic, nonviolent tactician of 20th century America. He explained to Dr. King why if he was going to be leading a nonviolent movement, why he could not carry a gun. Gandhi, Mohandas Karamshan Mahatma Gandhi in India said to Dr. Howard Thurman in 1936 that it would be the Negro who would teach the world nonviolence. MLK Jr. and his SCLC staff created the greatest ecumenical nonviolent movement in the history of the United States. I just told you, in case you missed it, that he brought together more diversity, more difference, more human pluralism in a nonviolent movement than anyone else had ever done or since in this country. Our guest speaker today is Morehouse College alumnus, Dr. Brandon Thomas Crowley. Class of 2008. His new book, which will soon be displayed on the LED video wall, published by Oxford University Press and on sale available in the lobby, put out by Oxford, will help make Dr. Crowley, another fulfillment of Mahatma Gandhi's prediction. Please hear this. Dr. Crowley will be, in my prediction, the greatest prophet of nonviolence since Martin Luther King, Jr. Why do I say that? Because he is about to address with his new book and the invitations he's going to get from coast to coast, violence perpetrated by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and all the rest of Christendom. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints just happens to be in the lead taking his advice. But the work is not finished. Now he's going to be more formally introduced to you by the Reverend Devin Jerome Crawford, our 
campus minister, campus ministry, the representative of the chapel. I hope you will start preparing your questions as you listen to their dialogue together. Thank you for coming. And if you are available, we'd like you to come back this afternoon at 530 for the Thurman Thursday Dialogue, where Dr. Crowley will also be present. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dean Carter. Good morning, Morehouse. Let's try that one more time. Good morning, Morehouse. Good to see everyone fresh off of spring break as we gather for this Bayard Rustin Crown Forum. We're pleased to have a son of Morehouse, a brother beloved, and my pastor, the Reverend Dr. Brandon Thomas Crowley, joining us as our interlocutor for this Bayard Rustin Crown Forum. I'd like to read some words of introduction about Dr. Crowley. The Reverend Dr. Brandon Thomas Crowley is an African-American pastor, <coughs> preacher, author, and scholar in religion, theology, and queer theory. Since 2009, he has served as the senior pastor of the historic Myrtle Baptist Church in Newton, Massachusetts, one of, the, one of America's oldest black churches founded by formerly enslaved persons at the end of Reconstruction. In addition to his pastoral role, Dr. Crowley is a lecturer in ministry studies at Harvard University's Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and has taught courses at Boston University, Emory University, the Episcopal Theological Seminary of the Southwest, the New York Theological Seminary, and the Meadville Lombard Theological Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. Reverend Crowley has earned his PhD in Church and Society and a Master of Sacred Theology with a Certificate in Social Justice from Boston University's School of Theology. He also earned a Master of Divinity from Harvard University's Divinity School and a Bachelor of Arts in Religion with a Certificate in Moral Cosmopolitan Pastoral Leadership from Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. Reverend Crowley's recently, recently published manuscript titled Queering Black Churches, Dismantling Heteronormativity in African American Congregations has been released by Oxford University Press. His scholarship reflects his commitment to challenging so societal norms within African American faith communities while forging innovative pathways for the future. Let us welcome Dr. Crowley at this time. So thank you, Reverend Crawford. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging our president, and I do want to call the name of Dean Carter, who is my mentor and an intellectual father and friend to my mind. I want to thank him for this opportunity and Quincy James Ryan Hart. Um, there are a number of members of my church here as well, Deacon Hagerbrook, whose son is a graduate of Morehouse. He was the chair of the search committee that got me to Myrtle. Mira Donaldson, uh, Spelmanite, and I believe Karis McDavid is somewhere in the room uh, as well. And um, I am so honored to be here and so excited to be able to share on this day, which is a day of great importance. Um, here we are inside of the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel, named after one of the greatest civil rights leaders um, of our nation and the world, while acknowledging the name of someone, Bayard Rustin, who was not only a teacher and a friend to Dr. King, but he is also one individual who experienced violence at the hand of Dr. King, uh, emotional and spiritual and cultural violence. Um, I'm not sure if many of you have had the chance to watch the recent film, Rustin, that has been released on Netflix. But a part of uh, Rustin's narrative is that as the architect of the modern civil rights movement, as a leader in the March on Washington, a teacher of pacifism to Martin King, um, he experienced homophobia and he was a victim of black heteronormativity. Um, there was a pastor 
of the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, New York, Adam Clayton Powell, who was very upset by um, the way that King was taking a lot of airtime in the movement for black lives at that time. He really saw himself as being one who had been championing this cause way before King. And as a way of sort of besmirching King's uh, work, uh, he says, I'm gonna spread out a rumor that you, Martin King, and Bayard Rustin are sleeping together um, if you don't fire him from leading this initiative. And so Rustin is fired. And that's really where the movie begins. The movie is brilliant in really capturing your attention in the first 15 minutes to sort of show you that this person of peace experienced great violence by the community that he was called to help and to heal. He literally was like Jesus. Rustin became the stone that the builders rejected. They needed him as a chief cornerstone, but he was rejected because of his difference. And I think it's low-hanging fruit for us to say, well, the reason that Martin King um, put Rustin out of the movement and stopped his participation for a period of time because they had to call him back. They, they needed his queer aesthetic to help to secure the success of the March on Washington. But I think it's low-hanging fruit to say the King only did that because the Bible told him so or because he was following an instruction of the word of God. I think a lot of times homophobic practices in black churches and in America, transphobic practices and heteronormativity are often um, upheld under the guise of doing the will of God. And we like to suggest that our homophobic practices are really the result of us reading the word of God. When the truth is, it is really our culture that informs how we interpret these sacred texts and how we handle these sacred texts. So um, one of the things that, that I talk about in the book is, well, why did Martin King do this? This is one of our greatest figures, and I'm very careful about hanging black laundry out in the, in, 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 in the white public um, for airing and drying. But I think it, it gives us a wonderful opportunity to really question history, to ask what was really undergirding the heteronormativity that we see King displaying um, in this particular context. And so my first chapter of my book is really trying to understand the history of the problem, the history of black heteronormativity and where it comes from. Um, I want to take a moment and just sort of define some words, um, and I don't know if they have this particular slide, but the main thing that I am attempting to dismantle, to take apart piece by piece in my scholarship and in my life's work is this word heteronormativity. What is that? Well, I want to first of all just say that um, heteronormativity is not biological. It is not nature, it is nurture. We are enculturated with an understanding that males and females are the only acceptable relationships that persons should participate in. Um, I, I think it's also important for us to think about heteronormativity from a sociological perspective, that it is a societal belief um, that the default or the norm for humanity as it pertains to sexual orientation is heterosexuality. Um, and, and heteronormativity is deeply rooted in cultural bias. And it's important to see that heteronormativity is also a concept or an idea that actually upholds sexism. It is a way of controlling women. It is a way of having this social order. When we often hear the rhetoric of of Donald Trump and others talking about make America great again, what they're really talking about is, is recovering an era in which women were in their place, they were barefoot and pregnant and serving as uh, subservient beings to men, where men were in charge. Um, and this sort of rhetoric has been extremely destructive for members of the human society who are, and the human family who are not white. 
I just want to talk just for a second about a preoccupation that we even have here at Morehouse that I think we have to begin to rethink, this preoccupation with this concept of manhood. Um, because the truth is, is that manhood in this country is something that was only attainable by white cisgendered men. It was a, it was a construct that was never um, constructed to be attained by black people. And it is also a preoccupation with replicating a certain type of white cisgender maleness or a certain type of whiteness. And this leads us to the question then, so where does heteronormativity come from, especially in the black context? Um, there are some thinkers who will make the argument that um, homosexuality is a white thing. And this work that Brandon is doing of trying to queer black churches, what he's really trying to do is just make the whole church gay. Um, and that is not what I am trying to do at all, um, because I talk about in my book, but also in my classes, that queerness is more than just an identity marker of persons who are LGBTQIAP+, but it is an aesthetic. It is a worldview, a way of being in the world that subverts the norm. To use Christian language, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. It is a radical move of equitability in the world. I am trying through queering to make accessible not only the black church space to be affirming towards LGBTQIB plus folks, but also disabled persons, um, immigrants, um, just the list goes on and on. Queerness for me is a modality, and especially queering, it is a modality of subversion that makes equality and equity a possibility within the world. It's a modality. So um, the question is, what is the history of black heteronormativity? So one of the assumptions is that black people are innately homophobic and transphobic and heteronormative because we are descendants of Africa. That Africa is innately just homophobic as an entire continent. And so when we were placed on ships and brought here, we brought with us this preconceived notion that persons who we now consider to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, asexual, pansexual, uh, plus um, were, were deviant, that they were um, disrespectful members of society. Well, research tells us that that actually is a lie. When you research West and Central African cultures, you will actually find that people that we now consider to be LGBTQIAP plus were actually sacred conduits to the spirit world. They were a part of the ecology and the community of African context. So it is important to understand that the, that the element of heteronormativity and homophobia and transphobia within the African context is not innately African. It is actually the product of colonialism. When white colonialists arrived on the continent, and saw all these variant forms of being and labeled those as deviant. And in the Christianizing of the continent, homophobia and heteronormativity sort of sits in after we're talking about, you know, now the sort of uh, transatlantic slave trade. So, so, so that's um, a very important thing to know. So that means that when our ancestors arrived in America, um, there was not this overarching consensus, consensus on um, slave ships, or uh, ships that were carrying human cargo, that um, male and female was the only way of coexisting within the world as it pertained to relationships. And we even see this in Native American context, where two spirit persons and three spirit persons are seen as normal and acceptable and full-fledged members of society. And so uh, colonialism and the terrorism of, of, of the Puritan movement and pu what we call Puritanicalism, you have these um, uh, religious radicals who come from Europe because they're running away from this sort of laissez-faire sort of French understanding of connection. And they, uh, one of the ways I like to describe the Puritans is in the form of if everybody who's MAGA just got together and decided they wanted to go to a new land and a new country to establish a country there. And that's essentially what happened. And their radical understandings of sexuality um, 
led their method of genocide in disrupting the cultures here on this continent that already existed. So the question becomes then, if, enslaved, if our enslaved ancestors did not come over here with a preconceived notion that was rooted in heteronormativity and homophobia, where did it come from? And so what I found in my research is that when persons, when enslaved persons, especially males, were seeking freedom, that they would use a process called buck breaking, in which they would bring a male into the open courtyard and call all of the enslaved um, uh, members of that particular community forward to watch this buck be sodomized sometimes with a broomstick, sometimes with the phallus of other human beings. Now, the question around the eroticism connected to that, I think, proves that um, um, whiteness has always had a preoccupation with the black phallus. We see this even in lynching moments that become extremely homoerotic. And when a black male is lynched, his phallus is dismembered, jarred, passed around even before being jarred as a relic and held as a warning sign to others, don't seek freedom. If you try to do this, this is what can happen to you. And so when you have a group of people who've already been traumatized through a slave trade, who have uh, varying notions of the spectrum of human sexuality and orientation and gender, who their first encounter with sort of same-sex interaction is in the form of reprimand. It does something to the human psyche. Let's go a little bit deeper. One of the ways that we know that um, our ancestors were being molested and raped is the produce, production of a mulatto class or a mixed race class. That becomes sort of biological proof. And I'm not you know, trying to biologically reduce the terrorism to just biology but I think this gives us biological proof. And um, so the question then becomes, well, what is the proof then? I, I had a sneaky suspicion that these white men have had an obsession with our bodies that even displayed itself during enslavement. So I spent about four months in the archives um, uh, in, in, in New Hampshire and found some court documents from the early 1700s where one of the first court cases won by enslaved persons against their enslavers was when a group of housewives found out that at the sex farm, which is one of the things that they would have in order to produce a free working class and labor force, uh, without having to purchase more enslaved persons, um, um, that, that there were these farms where they would often sit and watch sort of as pornograph you know, like pornography or like voyeurs to watch the enslaved, um, um, you know, forcing them into this sort of mating cycle. Um, but there were also narratives of these white males sort of sodomizing their male slaves. And when their wives found out about it, they filed a lawsuit in order to gain ownership of the property. And they and the enslaved actually won the lawsuit. And so what this teaches us is that also penetration, sodomizing, was also a form of terrorism and control within slavery. So when you take that in consideration, it helps you to understand that the sort of bedrock of African-American heteronormativity and homophobia is not rooted in our connection to the continent of Africa, but it is actually in response to colonialism as a form of survival and resilience to sort of suppress one's own sexual self in order to survive. Black males were being labeled as beasts and all these sort of things. So the suppression of one's sexuality becomes a part of that. I'm gonna tell one more part and then I'm gonna stop. Um, so then the, the next question comes, well, okay, but how do you translate that practice of heteronormativity from the, 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 the communal aspect of black life which I actually believe that black communal life predates black ecclesial life. Um, that, that the black church is not the beginning and that's part of the problem. I think Eddie Glaude sort of helps us to sort of get there um, because you know, there were a lot of African religions, a lot of stuff that was going on during that period of the practice of slave religion, uh, to use Rabbitoh's words. But so the question becomes, how does it then get codified in the church? 
Well, now we've got to move up to 1911, when the Great Migration is going on and people, black people are moving from the South to the North. And one of the things that black people in Harlem did not have at that time was a sort of place for a nightlife. And so as a result of that, um, gay and lesbian people started hosting, and drag queens and drag kings started hosting rent parties. Um, and, and at these rent parties, a lot of the black middle class who were heterosexual would come, they would enjoy themselves. White housewives began writing up op op-eds in the local newspaper saying, these black people are moving up from down, these Negroes are moving up from down south and they're like beasts. The women just like men, the men just like women, they're having these parties and they're going to fool around and they're going to molest and, and rape our children. And so Adam Clayton Powell Sr., not the congressman, but his father, who was the passive Abyssinian at the time, um, and, and a major leader in the black community, he launches the first ever campaign against homosexuality from the pulpit of the Abyssinian church in order to shut these rent parties down. And he uses language that James Dobson later on picks up. I don't know if the white man knew that he picked it up from a black uh, person. But James Dobson, in his ignorance, picks it up later on, this idea that homosexuality is a threat to the family. Um, and, and so the first campaign, what, what this teaches us is that the first campaign against homosexuals in black churches had nothing to do with the Bible. It had nothing to do with the book of Leviticus or the book of Romans, which we can talk about all those. It had to do with Adam Clayton Powell Sr. trying to help white people to view black people as civil. So the birthplace of heteronormativity in the black church is really rooted in trying to help black people to, to appear civil to the white gaze. So um, it trivializes the idea, this history that I talk about in my first chapter, it trivializes the idea that black people are innately homophobic because of our connection to Africa and that we are innately homophobic because we are wedded to the word of God. No, the truth is black heteronormativity is in response to whiteness. It is a, it is a black response to colonialism in which we are trying to make ourselves appear civil to white folk. And that becomes the problem with black churches practicing heteronormativity. When they do that, they become black churches in white face. Thank you. So the focus of your book is dismantling heteronormativity within African American congregations. Can you talk about the importance of this topic at an HBCU? Why, why it's important to talk about this, particularly at Morehouse College? Thank you for this question. So um, I am, um, I, I graduated in 2008, but I arrived on this campus in 2004. It was right on the heels of one of our Morehouse brothers being uh, brutally beaten in the showers uh, in the quad. Uh, this was something that was all over the news when I first got ready uh, to come to Morehouse. And I remember sitting in many crown forums and group discussions, you know, talking about the need for us to have a conversation about a homosexuality, you know, that was the sort of language that was used. It was not couched as we're going to talk about homophobia or heteronormativity as the problem. It was like we're going to talk about gay people and we're going to talk about homosexuality. Um, and 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 really, the 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 um, administration and the faculty was very nervous about how to facilitate this discussion. One of the failures of the administration at that time, dare I say, as a member of this house, was that we did not weave this need to have this dialogue pedagogically into the curriculum of the school, uh, which was a major, major failure, because this is a place of thought. This is a place of thinking. And, um, and let me just say as an aside, in coming here to have this discussion, I had this long talk, Dean Carter and I talk a lot, for 10 hours at a time sometimes. Uh, but we were having this discussion and I told Dean, I said, the Spirit spoke to me and said that to have this conversation with my brothers, um, and I wanna thank you brothers for your open-mindedness and willingness to have this conversation because when this conversation took place when I was a student, students booed, they walked out, um, they even walked out on Delman Coates when he had his speech. 
I told Dean, I don't think this needs to be one of them moments where I come back as a Morehouse man trying to use all of these homiletical skills to get the crowd up and moving to prove that I am a good preacher and speaker. I got a church for that. They take very good care of me. They hear me every week. Um, I wanted to sit down in this forum and have a dialogue because one of my arguments is you can't preach people into acceptance. It has to happen through dialogue and education in which you can give people the space to pose questions so that they can begin to comprehend what's going on. And so I really think uh, that although Morehouse may not want to, although we progressed from where we were when that great beating, beating happened, because I want to just say that it, I don't know what it's like now. I haven't had an opportunity to poll the students, but it was just something that you did not talk about. You didn't talk about being queer. You just didn't, you didn't acknowledge it. Um, and you performed a certain type of cisgendered politic of respectability in order to be accepted around here. Um, and as a result of that, um, HIV AIDS was running rampant through this campus when I was a student. My mother worked here as a phlebotomist taking blood and often it, they were not able to even share that blood as a donation because of the rate of the infection. And they found themselves having to have discussions with people not around their donorship, but around their status. And one of the things that I talk about in my book is one of the grave sins of heteronormativity is the element of silence that it casts over sexual exploration, and it doesn't normalize it, especially for children, which, which makes the cesspool of, of sexually transmitted diseases so thick. And, and I just want to say here that one of the things that I don't want to do is to demonize or besmirch or marginalize persons who are living and thriving with HIV. I think we have to be very careful of the stigmatization that can go along with that. But I don't know of a person that I have spoken to who is living with HIV who does not want to make sure that the next generation is not wrestling with this same issue. And so I think it is incumbent upon uh, us as a community, as brothers, to facilitate conversation around, I don't believe in microaggressions when it comes to heteronormativity, they're all aggressions. We need to talk about the way that heteronormativity undergirds a type of violence that takes place in, in uh, micro and macro ways on this particular campus. So I think it's important for us to talk about this not only in black churches, but on HBCUs because queer folk are here. There are gay brothers, queer brothers at this school. And many may not feel empowered to identify themselves as such. And I often encourage people whose cerebral cortex is not fully formulated to not rush to identifying yourself as anything yet. Give yourself the ability to explore and to experiment. That's one of the things that we fail to give our children the opportunity to do, to experiment and to get to know themselves and to get to know their bodies and to see in the context of this male-centered place, masturbation not as a dilapidation of one's seed, but as a celebration of one's own potential and a celebration of one's own body. And an awareness of what it means to bring oneself pleasure. One of the things that enslavement did is it prevented us from seeing ourselves as worthy of pleasure and to seeing the eroticism in that pleasure from an Audre Lorde perspective that goes beyond the pornographic. So you, you've be begun to allude, allude to this, but could you talk about why you wrote the book and why you want to queer black churches? So I wrote the book uh, because uh, I had served as pastor of the historic Myrtle Baptist Church of West Newton for eight years, uh, the proud pastor uh, at Myrtle, and I was sitting in my pulpit. I tell the story of this also in my uh, preface. I'm sitting in my pulpit, and she was my assistant pastor at that time. Um, she's now the pastor of her own church, Reverend Alicia Marie Johnson. She's preaching about the daughters of Zahafaloth. And this is a narrative where there are these women who do not have an elder brother and their father dies and they want to inherit their father's legacy and their father's money. This is really about economics, okay? And, uh, but the law says that they can't because they're women. 
and they pressure Moses to transgress the tradition, the Torah, and the law, the sacred text, to transgress it in order to give them what they rightfully deserve. And so she's preaching about the daughters of Zahafaloth, and she starts saying, Moses, if you would just come out the tent, come out the tent and transgress the law. Come out the tent. And I'm hearing this, and the Holy Spirit said to me, stand up and tell your congregation that you are a proud gay black Christian male. And I'm sitting there going, God, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? Like, I just got a new car, I just got a new apartment. Like, I, how am I going to afford this? They're going to put me out of this church. And I'm wrestling in my soul, in my seat, and the deacons can visibly see it. After she finishes preaching, I just take the plunge, stand up and say it. My congregation erupts in applause. Uh, one of the church mothers, one of the church clerk, uh, Yvette, uh, Yvette Lane, is the first person to get to me. I'm crying when I'm saying it because I'm nervous and I look up. My church is one of them stereotypical black churches where the church mothers wear hats and it's, it's, it's a mink coats, whole nine yard. And I look up and all I see is just church lady hats coming in my direction. Now in the history of my church, there was a pastor who made the women's ministry mad in the late 1800s and they beat him with an umbrella. They beat him with umbrellas. <laughs> Uh, and so I was nervous. I didn't know if they were coming to beat me with umbrellas. I didn't know what these church ladies were coming to do. And as I'm looking at them, the first one comes to me, Vet Lane, and she says, Pastor, we were waiting on you. We already knew. And they erupted in applause, and it was a beautiful sort of experience of love. But as time went on, the news got out in Boston that there's this guy who's come out. He's pastoring a historic church. <coughs> Queer people started showing up. And it became immediately obvious to me that just because my church had accepted me didn't mean that they knew what it meant to do ministry with and for LGBTQIAQ plus people. That, that just because they loved me because I was like a grandson to many of them, I was 22 when I got there. Uh, Dean Carter talked about the fact that I looked like I've gained weight. It's because the ladies in my church, they cook for me constantly. Casseroles, cakes, you know it. You gained weight while you were working at my church. Um, um, so... Um, it, it was an instance where they, they loved me, but, but they, they weren't being evil or malicious. They just didn't understand things. They didn't understand language. So um, the chair of my deacon board, uh, he, he wasn't the chair then, but he's the chair now, uh, Peter Goddard, he spoke up at a deacon meeting and said, Pastor, we need to go through a process, and you don't need to be a part of it. Because people need to have the opportunity to pose this question without feeling like they're offending you. They can't get to the place where you're trying to get them to until we create a space in which we are not dogmatic in our liberalism. And so the church went through its own self-initiated process that I stayed out of. I was nervous as could be. I was like, Lord, what's going to happen? Um, and the church you know, ended up voting two years later to become open and affirming. Um, and after this happened, um, I switched my dissertation project from studying churches like the Vision Church and Yvette Flunder's movement as a queering of black churches. And I started studying black churches that were historic, Baptists and et cetera, who had actually done this work. And then I put what my church had done into dialogue with all of the churches. I got about $60,000 worth of grants to study churches across the United States. Um, uh, even after my doctoral program through the Louisville Institute, Calvin Worship Institute, uh, Fund for Theological Exploration, and just did qualitative research all over the United States. Uh, as a way of offering the church universal, offering all black churches who wish to queer their context a method that they could use. Because many of the methodologies that I had discovered in queer theory were all written by white people with white faces. And you cannot talk about black sexuality from a white context. It's just not going to work. A lot of the manuals and booklets that we would use, that we were going to use as a congregation that I gave to Deacon Goddard and Wanda Whitmore, who was, they were both co-chairs, it all had white faces on it. And when you think about the fact that many black people have this preconceived notion that homosexuality is this white attack on black maleness and black manhood, you can't have white faces there. Um, but one of the interesting things we found is that nestled within the history of our church was a narrative of queering and queerness. The cover of the book 
is a, a is the stained glass window in my church and it's the window right behind the pulpit when I preach every Sunday and a lot of people make the mistake when they enter the church of thinking that this is Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist I made that mistake I don't know if you remember this during my uh, interview and Deacon Leonora Hill who was the one of the oldest members of the church she came up to me after she said Reverend that is not Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. That is Philip baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch. And I thought to myself, well, what in the world is that? So I started doing research on this. This was a narrative that I have to say, I remember the Ethiopian part, but not the eunuch. So I went and started doing you know, research. Um, and, and one of the things that a lot of queer scholars will do is they like to say that if you want to understand what a eunuch was in the biblical era, um, um, a sort of low-hanging fruit way to connect it is to say that these were persons who did not fit into the binary as being fixed males or females, um, persons that we might consider to be intersex. Also, they could have been, you know, persons who were LGBTQIA+. And we often tell the lie that Jesus didn't talk about sexuality and about persons who had other sexualities. That's a lie, because in the book of Matthews, after Jesus is having this discussion around divorce, when he's demonizing divorce, not two people making a decision to separate themselves, but men who were divorcing women because they wanted a younger version of a woman, and they would change the social status of women, Jesus says that is wrong. He's not demonizing divorced persons. He's demonizing men who are divorcing women because they want to whet their sexual appetites at the expense of women's class statuses. And immediately after that, someone asks the question, well, what are we supposed to do with eunuchs? And Jesus responds. He says, for those, there are some who have been called and shaped by God to be that way. There are some who were born that way. And there are some who have chosen to be that way. He gives this list. And he says, for those of you who cannot accept them, leave those people alone. But for those of you who can, uh, extend to them the grace of Jesus Christ. Even in when Jesus busts up in the temple and turns over the table and he says, my house shall be a house of prayer for all people. Jesus is stopping the, expo the economic exploitation that's happening in the temple. He's referencing an Isaiah passage when Isaiah says, this house shall be a house of prayer for all people and it includes eunuchs. Even the prophet Isaiah includes eunuchry. So here, um, uh, Philip is a great leader in the um, uh, church, the early church, Christian movement, the people of the way. He's uh, in town and he sees this Ethiopian eunuch, a black gay man with a lot of money riding in a fancy car. He sees him in a chariot. And um, the, the Bible says that he sees him reading a text and he wants to help him. And he goes up to him and asks, you know, how can I be in community with you to help you to read this text? This is a very important move around queering and what I wish white people would understand. Don't come into context trying to fix it, thinking you know the answer from a colonialist model. When you are trying to change a situation or to transition something, come in and ask people how you can help them whether they're disabled, whether they're queer, whether they're black, whether they're women, instead of superimposing a solution onto it. Um, so uh, the guy then, um, the, the eunuch invites Philip into the chariot and they're riding and he expresses to him that all you have to do is just believe uh, in, in Jesus Christ and you can be saved. And so they're uh, riding along, Reverend Moore, good to see you. They're riding along and, um, and the eunuch sees a pool of water. And he says, there's some water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? Now, laced within this question is the fact that the eunuch understands, as a part of the diaspora, that, that eunuchs were not traditionally, the prophet Isaiah comes in and gives an alternative narrative, but eunuchs were traditionally profiled at the door and not permitted to come into the temple. So the eunuch understands this. He knows what is to prevent him. It is what we would now consider to be heteronormativity. Um, so uh, he says nothing is to prevent you from being baptized. He takes him immediately out to the water. He baptizes him, and then he vanishes. What do we see here? We see here in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, 
the narrative, the book that tells us the beginning stories of the church, a narrative that proves that the original church was inclusive. I have some problems with the word inclusion, but I just want to use that there. I can talk more this afternoon when we do Q&A. We'll do Q&A this evening, not now. Uh, when we do Q&A this evening about more what I mean about that as opposed to the burden. So I want to, in light of what, you, what you've mentioned, uh, bring this back to our campus here at Morehouse College and, and ask what would it mean to queer Morehouse beyond the curriculum but even within the culture, given your research? I think we need to queer our preoccupation with white manhood and the performance of it. I think we need to queer our curriculum. Um, our curriculum, especially the history curriculum, is already a queered, if we're looking at subversion, it's already a queered form of sort of dominant history that we often hear in public school systems. We need to queer it even more uh, in order to incorporate that within our, con with, uh, that within our curriculum. Um, I, I think from a, uh, a relational model, I think we need to really think deeply what brotherhood really means and what brotherhood really is. Like, is brotherhood only limited to certain types of brothers? Um, and I think we need to do a deep um, interrogation and study of our history, our history prior to colonization. I, I think we have a preoccupation with a James Cone approach, and we need to take a Charles Longwood. And I think that will help us to get to the depths of what really undergirds uh, heteronormativity within a context like Morehouse. And finally, how can black churches be queer? Um, uh, so I think there are three ways. Um, um, one way has never been done, and it's theoretical, and that's denominational queering. And that's when a denomination decides it's like a hierarchical sort of model that we are going to declare ourselves as being open and affirming. I actually don't believe that denominational queering works in uh, most contexts. I know in the, the um, in um, uh, Mormonism, I think denominational queering is actually the way to go. But denominational queering really doesn't work in most contexts. And I'll give an example, like in the United Methodist Church, because denominational queering is really about making declarations. But for queering to be successful, it has to be contextual. And most denominations that become queer, they give congregations the opportunity to opt in or out. That happens in the Episcopal Church, it happens in the United Church of Christ, it happens in the uh, United Methodist Church. Like all of these churches are not affirming. It is based off of their preference. The second way, which is the way that it often happens in black churches, which is pastoral queering. We see this in the form of like a Delman Coates, who when he's uh, running as Lieutenant Governor, who begins to make uh, uh, pro-queer statements. We see this with the Raphael Warnock who begins to make pro-queer statements when he's running for senator. Uh, we see this in Jeremiah Wright who preaches good news for the gays. It is a sort of prophetic push within a pastor's heart to say we're not gonna do that homophobic stuff around here and I'm gonna counsel you and marry you. But the problem with pastoral queering is that it never pushes the congregation to have a conversation. It uses the bully pulpit to say this is the only thing we're gonna do around here. It also puts queer people at risk because when that pastor either dies, retires, or moves, it's up to the next pastor to determine if that church will remain affirming. The quintessential way of doing it is utilizing a model that I created in my book titled Black Ecclesial Query, which is a communal model which through dialogue and through education, people have conversations that give a congregation the tools to be able to transgress the hetero norm uh, within their context. Thank you so much, brothers. Could we thank Dr. Crowley for this tremendous presentation this morning? We invite each of you to join us at 5.30 here in the chapel. We'll be in the chapel library to my left. We'll, we'll take the questions and answers after Thurman Thursday this evening. And we invite all of you to join us at 5.30 in the, in the chapel library. Immediately after Crown Forum, Dr. Crowley will be signing copies of his book in the lobby of the chapel directly behind you. So we encourage you to uh, rush to the table to get your signed copy. I believe we have 150 copies. And so we encourage all of you to get your copy and join us at 5.30 this evening.
Okay. What? white male heteronormativity and like I'm a straight black male however I have noticed how um, heteronormativity has damaged us in a way it damages everybody and an example of that is how like people don't wh where I was from people greet each other by giving each other a hug people don't do that here and I've noticed how that can lead to like people feeling less as more estranged, more like separated from other people because where I'm from, we we would show how close we are, how much we respect each other by walking each other, giving give each other a hug. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to ask you is, where do you think? Because it's I know it comes from more than the church, but where does that I attitude of men have to be separate in order to stay masculine? Mm come from and how do we get rid of it? I think it's a technique of survival and resilience that is a response to our trauma. And I thank you so much for bringing out the point that uh, one of the ways that I think heteronormativity does show up is in the ways that we are afraid to show affection from male to male. This even shows up oftentimes with fathers and sons. I'm not just talking about platonic connections between friends. And one of the things that I love about my relationship with my father is that my father hugs me. My father tells me that he loves me. Uh, my father sends me text messages, you know, saying that he loves me and that he's proud of me. Uh, but that is something that often doesn't happen because of this performance of a certain type of manhood, which is really toxic. And we are choking ourselves trying to live into this identity that is really harmful for us trying to perform in this way this hard sort of presentation that is hard to keep up when the truth is on the inside, many of us are way more affectionate and way more communal than I think we allow. Um, thank you so much for your question. Let's take the next two together. Also, can I find your sermons online? Sir? Oh yes, I'm all over YouTube, I am, I am. All right, how you doing? My name is Elijah. Good morning. I'm from San Diego, California, free speech has made this all kind of stuff personal. Oh, okay, dope. Um, my question is to you, uh, should we mold our lifestyle to God's word, or do we mold God's word to our lifestyle? Yes. So uh, this let's let's take the second question too. Yes, because I may have to get into that this evening because I know we have to get out of here. But yes, thank you for that question. Yes. Uh, hey, what's up, uh, Malik Jihad Pool, senior software engineering major, Bay Area, California. Um, first off. I really liked your whole uh, presentation. It reminded me a lot of this like uh, Kwame Ture speech I listened to back in the day where he talked about the differences between European culture mm -hmm. and African culture as it relates to African culture being a culture of freedom versus a culture of dominance and you know rigidness. And But anyway, that's besides the point. I just wanted to ask, um, how much is that book? And also, what recommendations do you have for continuing to research our pre-colonial history when it comes to sexuality and identity? Yes, so there is a book called Fee by S Snorton. Uh, see me right afterwards, I'll tell you the book, yeah. Female Wives, Female Hus something like that. I'll, I'll tell you the name of that book. I always right. forget the name of it. And yeah. the book yeah. is $20. 20? Um, so um, can we say? Oh, there are free copies. The, one of our Morehouse brothers has donated 20 free ones. So if there, if there are some oh, who desire some, uh, do, do please come up and ask. Okay, I want to awesome. respond just very quickly to your question. Thank you so very much for posing that. So I think the first thing I would do is come out right out of the box and say that I do not believe that the Bible is the unadulterated word of God without error. I actually believe that the Bible contains uh, errors because it was written by human beings. For us to say that a book that was written by human beings does not contain error means that we as human beings have the ability to create God. And I do, believe, I do not believe that we have the ability to do that. So believing in the fallibility of the Bible is actually a way of substantiating our belief in the vastness of God which cannot be contained. 
As a result of that, we as African American people have always possessed a hermeneutic of suspicion around this book, which has traditionally been used and weaponized against us to keep us in our places, whether it be with slave, obey your masters, women be subservient to men. I think that we have a preoccupation with this assumption that it is the word of God that has fallen ex nihilo out of the sky without human involvement, and that interpretation is not inextricably linked with culture, which makes us then put the word of God in front of the method of interpretation, suggesting that culture is not the real progenitor to the method through which we use to interpret scripture. So um, I, I think the, 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 the problem that I would have in trying to conceptualize and even get into or penetrate the depths of the question that you're asking is that it presupposes that there is this word of God that is at odds with culture. I think the Niebuhr brothers help us to deal with that with Christ versus culture, Christ over culture, Christ with culture. I'd recommend that you maybe um, check out uh, the Niebuhr brothers for that. But we can definitely talk more afterwards. Let me get this brother right quickly. Um, can you hear me? Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, sir. Um, so my question was, as you mentioned earlier, was it about uh, the, the eunuch in relation to uh, was it the eunuch in relation to queering in the black churches? Uh, uh, that the eunuch becomes a way of thinking about the possibility of affirmation within the early church movement. Okay. Um, and like how, how does that correlate into how we see queering with it or the, the diminishing of queering in the black churches now or the negation of it? Ah, so uh, I, I think it is... Okay, can you restate the question? No, I'm gonna ask him to repeat it again, Dean, so I can make sure that I'm clear. Say the, say the question again. Um, all right, I'm trying to, so my question was how does, how is like the eunuch, where is the correlation with the eunuch in the dismantling or the negation of querying in the black churches? Okay, thank you so much. So he's asking, what is the connection between the eunuch, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and this narrative and queering in the black church? So uh, the first thing that I would say is that Philip's affirmation and the communal connection and context that he creates with the eunuch, I think resembles what I am suggesting that black churches must begin to do, to be willing to be in community, go up to the chariot, be in community, be in conversation and ask how we can be of assistance and help persons who identify as LGBTQIA+. And when queer folk seek full acceptance into the body of Christ, which they are already a part, let me just say that that's already the case, we're dealing with working from, a, from the back end. But when they seek full inclusion through ordination, through preaching, through the opportunity to pastor a church, that we behave like Philip and say nothing is to prevent you. Uh, from being a part. And so Philip gives us an example of what it means to affirm persons who are different. And I think we as the church universal, but particularly black churches, we've got to do a better job in being more like Philip um, and less like the colonialist models that we've become. I want to thank everyone for their questions. Again, we invite you to come back at 530 this evening in the Chapel Library for an ongoing conversation with Dr. Crowley, as well as to join him in the lobby for a book signing directly after Crown Forum. At this time, we ask that all would stand for the singing of the college hymn, Dear Old Morehouse, and we want to invite Mr. Andarius Porter to lead us in the singing of the hymn. Dear Old Morehouse, Dear Old Morehouse, we have pledged our lives to thee and will ever, yea, forever give ourselves in loyalty. True forever, true forever to old more. May we be 
Make us steadfast, honest, true. To old Morehouse and her 